for a few moments of your time, uh, God has something to say from 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to read from verse 6, and I'm going to do better than I did the early service. We didn't make it down to verse 10. We'll just stop at verse number 9. There's a word from the Lord for anybody who's willing to listen. How many of you have been praying about something? Anybody been praying about something? God is going to give you the answer today. Now, the question is not whether or not God is going to give you the answer. The question is, are you going to hear it? So hear the word of the Lord today. Humble yourselves, therefore under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you at the proper time. I think I'm going to spend more time there. That he may exalt you at the proper time. Everybody say, at the proper time. time. Casting all your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. Be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. But resist him, firm in your faith. Another version says staunch in your faith. Knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in in the world. You may be seated. Thank you, sir. How to survive a satanic attack? And let me add this without losing your mind. How to survive a satanic attack without losing your mind? I don't know what you're going through. Uh, and let me just say our hearts go out to the Beale family and the Brown family. Our brother Jerome uh, transitioned out of this life. Uh, and he was... Uh, funeralized and memorialized on uh, this week, and uh, our hearts go with that family. But children of God know that uh, leaving here is equivalent to a baby leaving the mother's womb. We're just born into another world. And for us, death is the beginning of life. To those of us who believe that, to those of that us who believe that, to those Christians who believe what Jesus said. I'm beginning to wonder, where am I? But I don't know what you're going through, and I don't know what's going on in your life, but I know that God is going to say something because one of the things that I know that is common with all of us is that all of us suffer. Some of us suffer in silence. Some of us suffer out loud. Some of us suffer where everybody can hear it. Some of us bring other people into our suffering. Some of us are suffering and don't know it. Some of us are, are, are explicit with our suffering. Some of us are, are people who explode in our suffering. Some of us implode it. The worst of us, those of us with the hardest issues of health, are those of us who suppress our suffering, suffer in silence who are in a denial about our suffering and the things that we're going through. We don't want to reach out for any help because we were taught and we were bred as we were coming up that we got this, handle your own business. Even young men, we're taught not to cry about things. Man up, stand up. You fall and scrape yourself. Just ignore it and stand up. You got it. Stand up. Why are you crying for? As a matter of fact, when we were children, if certain of us, our mom or grandma or dad or whoever it was, if we were crying too long, they told us they went from, it's going to be all right to plain old shut up. I want to talk to honest people this morning. I really don't have time to talk to church people this morning. I don't have the energy to talk to church people. I need to talk to honest, real people this morning. It went to shut up to, if you don't shut up, I'm going to give you something to really... Any real people in here? As a matter of fact, there's a, there's a thing about suffering is that everybody does it, but not everybody knows how to handle it, and nobody, everybody no, doesn't know how to survive it. It's very possible for your suffering to end, but you not to have survived it. 
It's very possible to go through suffering, to go through something painful, to go through something agonizing, to go through something traumatic, to go through something that threw you off, that discouraged you, that frustrated you, that caused you to cry, that caused you to shout, that caused you to pout, that caused you to be down and out. And it's very possible for the storm to be over, but the aftermath to kill you. It's very possible for your suffering to be over, but for you to not be over your suffering. Peter here is writing to a suffering church. I need you to know that when you open up 1 Peter, Peter, you remember the guy that denied, that, that, uh, not, that denied Jesus and, and, and said, I don't know the man? Peter, the one who Jesus picked, Peter who talked too much, who kind of talked more than he listened, Peter who Jesus picked even though Peter was a thug and carried a knife and would almost cut somebody, it did cut somebody's ear off because you might not have known that. I don't want to assume you know that, but one of the disciples of Christ, one of the guys that walked with him was so thug life that when the soldier came to get Jesus, he took his knife off and cut off his ear. It was crazy. He stood there, looked at the rest of the soldiers, the other soldiers, and was like, now what? That's not, don't look for that in the text. It's not in there. I've just put that part in there. But I'm not, I'm not just trying to be funny. I'm just trying to show you that Jesus was interested in normal people with flaws. He didn't pick perfect people to follow him. He didn't pick people that didn't have flaws and weren't messed up and didn't have problems. Peter was somebody that was messed up, and he was, he was not only messed up in those areas, but he was prejudiced and he was biased. And he had so many issues, but Jesus said, follow me. How many issues did you have when Jesus said, follow you? Follow him to you. Well, Peter's writing this, and he's writing this to a church that's suffering. They're suffering, and they're just at the beginning of their suffering. They're going to suffer more. This letter was written in A.D. 62 and 63. And from the beginning of this book, this letter, Peter goes in. Chapter 1, verse 6, he tells them that they're going to be in distress for a little while. Chapter 4, verse 12, he says, if, if, you know, need be, you suffer for a little while. The word suffer is all through this, this book. Suffer, suffer, suffer. And it's just the beginning of it. They were going to suffer more because in A.D. 65, Nero who was the emperor, was going to rise up and he was going to burn Rome. And in order to cover himself and to cover his own guilt, he was going to blame the fires that he started in Rome on this group of people that were fanatical, the group of people called Christians or the Nazarenes. And everybody would hate Christians because of this false accusation of the emperor. And so their suffering had only just begun. And so when you talk to a group that are suffering, one thing people that are suffering need, one thing people that are in distress need is they need leadership. And so Peter here writes in the beginning of chapter 5 and he basically tells the elders of the church, as he was one, that you need to feed the flock. The last thing you need to do when you're suffering is get rid of the word of God. It baffles me how when people are in a fix, they stop coming to church. Are you kidding me? When you're in a fix, when things are falling apart in your life, when you get sick, when you got loved ones that are in trouble and your money is funny, the the thing you're going to do is get away from the teaching of God. I mean, who runs away from medicine when they're sick? The last thing you need is to be away from the people of God. You need to be where the people of God is are and you need leadership. So he talks to the leadership in chapter 5 verses 1 through 4 and he basically tells them to feed the flock. Because when people are sick with suffering, one of the things that happens when you're sick is you lose your appetite so you have to be fed. Because you won't eat. And when you won't eat, you have to be fed. And the church was suffering, and he said, feed the flock. And then he said, be humble. He told the young men to to respect and be humble when it came to the elders of uh, of the church. And then he says, I want to get right to it, verse number 5, he ends by saying that God does something to the proud. He resisted the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Everybody say humble. Point number one, if you're going to survive... 
if you are going to survive suffering and still retain your mind, it, the first thing you have to do is humble yourself. Everybody say humble yourself. We sing that song and we sing that song, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, but what does that look like? What do people who humble themselves do? What are the best practices of people who humble themselves? If I were being, very, I'm going to be very technical today. Number one, decrease everything being about you. Write that down. This is good stuff. You cannot walk around writing a narrative that has you in the middle. Everything cannot be about you. At some point, you got to stop taking selfies and take some pictures of other people. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Your trouble can't be about you. Your heartache can't be about you. Your trial can't be about you. Your sickness can't be about you. You have to get to a point where you are in the process of emptying you with you. Because as soon as you start emptying you with you, there's less inside of you to be offended. The reason why some of us are offended so easily is there's so much us in us that some of the things we're suffering, we wouldn't suffer if, it wasn't, if there wasn't so much us in us to be offended. Y'all not, y'all not, y'all not understanding this. Y'all not. You need to pay attention to what offends you. Because it may offend you because you made things about you. When you humble yourself, what you do is you begin the process of emptying yourself of you. Your pain is not about you. Your hardship is not about you. And you have to remind yourself that. Now, is that easy? No, it's not. But in verse number six, I want you to notice something. He says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. Now, I got to tell you something that this verse in the original language, it's in the passive voice. So it doesn't quite say humble yourself. It says be humbled under the mighty hand of God. You got to pay attention. Pay attention closely. Now, some Greek theologians believe it's in the first first person and it's, it's not passive. So it means humble yourself. It's actually a combination, and what it sounds like is, humble yourself to be humbled by God. Okay? Humble yourself to be humbled by God. Uh, I don't like going to doctors. When I got sick, I, I was real low down dog sick. Because like most men, I don't like going to the hospital. Are there any men in here that feel like that? It takes a lot for a man, for most men, to go to the hospital. Because men, we like to have a sense of control. So we'll go to the hospital when we make ourselves better. It's humbling to go. We have to humble my. When I got sick, I had to humble myself and go to the hospital. When I got to the hospital, the nurses and the doctors humbled me. Okay, let me say that again. I had to humble myself to go. When I got there, the nurses and the doctors humbled me. I had to bring myself low enough and to bring myself down enough to surrender to go And once I got there, they humbled me. What do you mean they humbled you, Brother Hamilton? I had to put on a robe with my backside all out. I had to lay in the bed and and, and have a pot up under me. I had to subject myself to being shot and woke up in the middle of the night, awakened in the middle of the night to take a shot. Oh, I'm here to take your blood pressure. It was a humbling experience. But I had to first make the decision to humble myself, to put myself in that position to where I'm humbled. God is not just going to humble you. What, What Peter is saying is you've got to make the first move. Humble yourself. And then when you humble yourself and get low enough, God will humble you, not in a punitive way, but what God wants is he wants to get to the last part of the verse where it says, and he will lift you up. But God is not interested in lifting up anybody who doesn't come to him low enough in humility. Some of us are too up 
to be lifted up. And God is saying, you too high for me to lift you up. And if I lift you up high now, the elevation would kill you. So what you got to do is you got to get low. Come to me. I'm going to humble you. And I'm going to make it to where you can survive the elevation that I'm going to put you on. How many of you understand that? But it begins with humbling yourself under the mighty hand of God. Exodus 13, 9 talks about the hand of God. Let me help you understand what that means. To humble yourself means you have to relinquish control. Some of us are control freaks. Let me say that again. Y'all didn't hear me because y'all... Some of the control freaks said amen. Some of us are control freaks. The time we like to be controlled the most, here's the time we like to be most in control. It's when we're suffering. Come on now. We want to be most in control when we're in pain. God says to, through Peter to a church that's suffering. He says, at the point you want most to be in control is the time you must surrender it to God. God says, when you humble yourself under my hand, you humble yourself under my sovereignty where you as an individual in whatever you're going through, take the attitude of whatever God is doing with me, I'm okay with it. Let me say that again. Whatever God is doing with me, I'm okay with it. It doesn't mean to be helpless by circumstance, but it means to help yourself less. Oh, Y'all missed that. Boy, 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 boy. Just take notes. It doesn't mean to be helpless, but it means to help yourself less. It means no longer do you try to defend yourself. No longer are you trying to save yourself. No longer are you trying to fix yourself. No longer are you trying to decorate yourself so that you look a certain way to people. No longer are you trying to win. And some of us, our problem is we try to win too much. It means that sometimes you've got to learn to lose in God's hand. Because I'd rather lose in God's hand than to win outside of his hand. And God says, under my hand, there will be some times where you will lose. But humility demands surrender. It demands that you get to some point in your life where you say, Lord, I, I can't. I can't. I can't. I, I tried. I can't. I'm not making any phone calls. I'm not going to complain about it. I'm not going to fuss. I don't talk to everybody I can talk to. I can't. And you become okay with where God's sovereignty takes you. The best example of this was Joseph. You remember Joseph? His brothers took him and threw him in the pit. You never see where he tries to climb out of the pit. The same brothers that were envious of him before throwing him, throwing him in the pit strip him of his coat of many colors. You never see him fight to get it back. Those same brothers, after they threw him in the pit, uh, uh, there were some travelers that came and took him out of the pit and, uh, and they went and lied to their dad. You never see anywhere in that, in that story where Joseph ran to dad and told dad they lied. Surrender and humbly surrendering to God means that he's your defender. And some of us exhaust a lot of energy trying to defend ourselves and make our own way and vindicate ourselves that God is saying, I was fighting your battle for you, but the reason why you keep getting hit is because you're in the way of my swing. 
I would swing at your enemies, but you keep getting in the way trying to swing. You stand here, stay under my hand, let me fight the battle because the battle don't even belong to you. I got you. I got you. You may hurt. You may be in pain, but I got you. Let me handle your suffering. Let me handle your affliction. Let me handle your enemies. Stay out of my way. That's when you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. People who practice humility are okay when somebody tells them an uncomfortable truth. They're okay with it. Somebody say, "Uh, uh, you ain't nobody. He's nobody. And it's funny because in our pseudo humility, we walk around and we say, I'm just a nobody. Church, I'm just a nobody. And let me just tell you something about this for those of you who are new. Whenever you're talking to somebody, let me, I need everybody to see me. This is a good thing to know. Whenever you're talking to somebody and they start doing like this, they lying. Okay? Some of y'all didn't hear that. Just, just watch people. Whenever they bend over and they start doing, I'm just a nobody. Trying to tell everybody, just he lying, trust me. He's backing up so you don't read the truth. That's what he does. I'm just a nobody trying to, but it's something. We get this pseudo humility. I'm just a nobody. True humility does not get offended when somebody calls you what you know you are. You see how, you see how just being humble will minimize your own reaction to your enemies? Your enemies will be right. You minimize your reaction. Here you are going to fight and getting all upset and get a, you know, I, I don't know what she thinks. She's nobody. Well, if you really believe that, that's one less thing you have to be offended by. On to the next. Oh, you just telling me what I already know. You're right. I am nobody. But look at what God is doing with this nobody. He's still pulling something out of nothing, baby. But we get offended because we really don't believe it. We believe we should believe it, but we don't believe it. When you are under God's hand of hum- of hum- in humility, you're all right wherever his hand takes you and no matter what the journey consists of. Because God says, when the time is right, I'm going to lift you up. I will lift you up when the time is right. There's nothing more dangerous. Oh, hear me. Oh, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. There's nothing more dangerous, people of God, than premature elevation. Premature elevation. Getting where God is going to lift you before God does it. The enemy's job to defeat you is he wants you to get there before God gets you there. Because if you get there before God gets you there, he can take you down. But when God elevates you, No enemy in hell, no enemy walking the face of the earth, no two-footed, haircut, having, weave, wearing enemy can bring you down because they didn't put you up there. God put you up there and you didn't get there before it was time. He's telling, Peter is telling these people, in spite of your suffering, stay okay under God's hand and when the time is right, and only he knows when the time is right, he's going to lift you up. The problem is some of us are so used to being lifted up by people that we have confused man's elevation with God's. If you can be brought down by man, it probably wasn't God's elevation. So he says, humble, humble, humble. Now, whenever the word of God goes out, God is getting you ready for something. I don't know what it is. He's getting you ready for something. He's getting you ready for a test. No teacher teaches a class to prepare a student for nothing. 
the student is being prepared for a test. Somebody's going to offend you. Before the day is out, somebody here is going to get offended. What offends you about what offended you? That's what you need to ask yourself. Because when you're under God's humble and his mighty hand and you're taking a position of humility, you cannot be broken because you cannot break what is already broken. And you take the posture of being broken under God. Have you ever felt really, really down? Or have you been really, really sick? Uh, when you get to a certain point where you're really sick, I'm talking about I see you sick, and somebody comes in and they say, oh, you know what, I got a, I got a little cold. Everybody in the room might talk bad about that. But when you're trying to survive and get well, you don't care about who else comes in there. You come in with a cough. When I was on that bed of, that bed of affliction, that might have been somebody in there coughing. I was concerned with my own brokenness. And I had, I was too busy being broken. As a matter of fact, I was too busy being broken to be worried about fixing everybody that came in the room. And you know you're walking in humility because suddenly you won't have time to fix everybody. And some of us are masters at fixing other people and telling them how to do it and telling them where to go. But when you walk under the humility of God under his hand, then you don't have time because you're broken yourself and you know how much you need the Lord to fix you. Let's move on. Let's move on because there's a part I want us to see that excites me. It, it excites me here in this verse. The Bible says, he says, he says, he may exalt you at the proper time. How, how? How do we get this humility? The next verse says casting. Yeah, yeah. Casting. You need to know that casting means, it doesn't mean to give. You know, we, 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 we hear little cliches and singing. We say, give it to the Lord, child. Give it to the Lord. Uh, casting is a word that denotes more urgency. Yes, sir. Um, how many of you remember the game hot potato? Yes. Raise your hand. Some of you are dating yourself right now. Mm-hmm. Some of you say, I don't know what he's talking about. Yeah, you know, you old enough to know and remember. You know, at first when the game starts, you just give the potato to the next person, right? You know, I forget the music that goes along with it, right? Hot potato, hot potato, hot potato. You just give it to the next person. You don't mess up my illustration. You just give it to the next person. Hot potato, hot potato. Then the, I think the music starts getting faster, and then it comes to an end. That last hot potato, you don't give. What do you do? You cast it. Because that last hot potato is an urgent one. Be urgent about casting your care on the Lord. In other words, you can literally throw it to God. I know we say give it to God, but it means to throw it on God because God is able to carry it. It says, for he cares for you. It did not say, in the original text does not say he cares about you. This is what I wanted to get to. The original text does not say he cares about you. Hear this, Mountain View. Just because a person cares about you doesn't mean they have the wherewithal to care for you. God doesn't just care about you. He cares for you. People care about you until you get sick enough. Then you have to depend on people who will care. God doesn't just care about you. Yes, he loves you. He feels a certain way about you. But he is actively caring for you even while you think you are caring for yourself. He says, I can handle it because I am actively caring for you. There's no burden you are ever carrying that can ever burden me because I'm carrying you. And if I can carry you with your burdens, I can carry your burdens. We have to learn in our humility to release. Turn to, turn to two people and tell them to release it. Okay, so if you, if you turn to two people, right? So let me just say, if you turn to two people, then I should have heard release it twice. 
So on this time to pass the test that I just gave, treat it like the star test, turn to real people, two, look them dead in the face and tell them to release it. Amen. Amen. I know those seats are comfortable. Some of y'all, release it, release it, release me. Verse number eight, and we'll, we'll stop at verse number eight. He says, here's how you're going to survive the attack. Cast your cares on the Lord for he careth. And then he says, now be sober. Be vigilant. That means to be on guard, not paranoid. Then he calls the devil Satan. He says, your adversary. It's a legal term. It means that the devil is never on your side. He will always vote against you. He will always accuse you. He is the accuser. He's the accuser of the brethren. What does that mean? Again, I want to teach everybody like nobody knows what I'm talking about. If you've ever been to a court, you know that there's the defense attorney. And that's usually if you're the one that got in trouble, you get a defense attorney. Come here, defense attorney. The defense attorney. And then on the other side you have what's called the prosecuting attorney and then before both parties you have the judge. (laughs) Not the jester. (laughs) The judge. Yes. Face us. Don't make this about you, Jones. I wish I had Mike. They may know each other. I don't know if you've ever been to a court case or ever seen it or ever been to court. But those lawyers know each other. As a matter of fact, it'll make you nervous how well they know each other. It'll make you think they're working in cahoots. Hey, Stu. All right, Stu. Hey, Colin. Hey, Tim, how y'all doing? And they may even shake hands. Hey, how's it going? See, that makes me nervous. Okay? They know each other. Now, it doesn't matter how friendly this guy look, looks. He is not my friend. His job is to prove to the judge that I am guilty and to continue through with a sentence. He is the adversary. But I'm standing with another person. He is the advocate. Now, both of them I'm standing with or between. One is against me and the other is for me. Peter says, be sober, be vigilant. Because it doesn't matter how friendly he is. It doesn't matter whether or not he can fulfill our lusts. It doesn't matter or not how, how cordial he is. The adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour in accusation. Which means that it's best for us in order to survive the attack not to flirt with the prosecuting attorney but to draw closer to the advocate we have in Jesus. Go to Zechariah chapter 3. I'm going to show you what happens in this scene. Yeah, Zechariah, real life. You can go. No, 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 no. You stay here. I'm going to show you this. This blew my mind. Joshua, who was the high priest, or Yeshua, who was the high priest in Zechariah. And I know it's going to take a while for those of you who are turning pages because that's not a book of the Bible we usually go to. Chapter 3, verse number 1. Watch this. Then he showed me Joshua, the uh-huh. high priest. Read. Standing before the angel of the Lord. Standing before the angel of the Lord. Read. And Satan... Satan, Satan, what? Standing at the right hand to accuse him. Sat- Satan standing at the right hand to do what? Accuse him. He wants to accuse the high priest. Read. 
And the Lord said to Satan, And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. You are rebuked, Satan. Read. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem uh, rebuke you. Uh huh. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Uh huh. Now Joseph was clothed with filthy garments and standing before the Now devil. watch this. This is what he was guilty of. He was guilty of being dirty. You want to see what Jesus does? You want to, you, do you want to understand why it's important to be humble? Because there's nothing about us that would, that, watch this, that would end up with an innocent verdict. There's nothing about us. If we stood before God by ourselves, there's nothing about us that's innocent. The high priest stood with dirty clothes. Read. And he spoke and said to those who were standing before him. Uh huh. What? Remove the filthy garments from. This him. is what Jesus does. Jesus says, "I'm not. Look, I'm not going to go back and forth with Satan over accusing you because that's what the adversary does. I'm not going to defend every bad thing you did wrong. I'm not going to give an explanation, and I don't need you to. As a matter of fact, you shut up. This conversation is between the advocate and the adversary. But what the advocate does do." is he takes off our filthy clothes so that in the very presence of the enemy and the adversary, the adversary no longer has a case because Jesus changed us right in his face. That's why it takes humility. Just like I got to the doctor and they changed me. I had to be humble enough to go to the hospital and be humbled by them so that I can be fit to be better and elevated. And what God does in the face of Satan is he will change you right in his face to where what he's accusing you of doesn't even apply anymore. He took off his filthy clothes. And so Peter says, you need to be careful. Be vigilant. He ain't your friend. Don't get it twisted. He's not your friend. And anybody who he's working through is not your friend. He's the adversary, and he is seeking whom he may devour. But how do I survive that? The next verse says, but be firm in your faith. What does that mean, Mountain View? Somebody needs this. Some of you have been beat up, and you're suffering. It's not like suffering alone. Thank you, Al. It's a lonely time. It's a lonely place to suffer by yourself. Yes, sir. Some of the loneliest people are the people that have people around them all the time. Yes, sir. And you're suffering. I want to talk to you who are help other people. You're the encourager. You're the pillar in your family. You're the one that everybody goes to for the answers. And nobody can fathom that you're suffering. Because you spend your time making everybody happy. You spend your time making sure everybody else is okay. As a matter of fact, you look so okay to them that whenever you go through th something, they assume that you don't need their help and you somehow just going to get out of it. I know I'm talking to at least 10 people in here. You the one they go to for prayer. Something happened financially, you're the one they go to for finance. You're the go-to person, go-to, go-to, go-to. Your suffering almost doesn't matter. I want to tell you, when you get to the point where you feel like you're about to lose it, it's okay to hurt. It's okay to shout. It's okay to have moments of frustration. It's okay to give a helping hand, but one thing you had better do don't let go of your faith. Do you see what the, what the devil is trying to do? If the devil's after you so hard, don't you get it? I need to get closer to somebody in here. Don't you get it? You don't get it? You don't get why he's pressing you? You don't get why he's all up in your family mix? You don't get why he's so after your kids? You don't get it? You don't get it why he's on your job? You don't get it why he's working through your kids? You have something he wants. Yes, That's how it works. If he ain't messing with you, you ain't got nothing he wants. 
Hello? You don't understand why it's like that? You don't understand why your coworkers are hating on you? You don't understand how come you get healthy and then you get sick again? You got something he wants. And as long as you hold on to it, he's going to keep coming after you. But remember, you have humbled yourself under the mighty hand of God. And though you have something he wants, God has you if you stay under his hand. What do you have? That next verse says, stay firm in your faith. And some of us are having a hard time holding on to it. When I was a little boy, I didn't know sports even back then. But I knew that the object of the game was when they pass you the ball, run. Yeah, that's what I knew. We used to play tackle, and then there was two-hand touch. And we, play, we played on concrete because there was no grass where we lived in New York. Concrete jungle. New York. Anyway. And I remember the pressure getting so heavy. Jamel, Jamel. And even in basketball, I'd say, pass it, pass it, pass it, pass it, pass it, pass it. And I was asking for something I wasn't ready for. Because when they passed it, I saw everybody coming. Because, you know, when, you, when you're that young, you, you don't play by rules. As a matter of fact, they just start coming for you. See, when you, when you pray for more faith, you had, be, you had better be ready. I'm not talking about more suffering. I'm talking about more enemies. I'm talking about more opposition. And I remember playing ball, ball one time, football one time on the street, and they were, the pressure was getting so bad, so bad, and they were coming, and they were like, oh, and they were talking, and I was intimidated, and I just, <laughs> and they got off of me. I know that's funny, right? I mean, here I was, I was running, and he was head, high telling, and I just, and then they ran after the ball, and I felt safe. And that's why some of us let go of our faith. Because we want the devil to stop messing with us. We forget that we got somebody running beside us. And just when it looks like we're going to be vanquished, he blocks for us. But you got to be humble. Don't get on the field acting like you know. Don't get in the field acting like you can't drop it. And life may tackle you. God knows life may tackle you. You may not always bear a smile on your face. You'll lose friends and gain enemies. And you may get bruised, beat, and battered. And you may still suffer. But don't drop the ball. Hold on to your faith. Peter was telling this suffering church, if you're going to survive this, you got to hold on to your faith. Humble yourself. Cast your care. And hold on to your faith. Somebody's getting weak in their faith right now. You're tired of running. You just want the devil to leave you alone. You're tired of fighting. You're just tired. Tired of trying to please people and be okay with everybody. Tired of trying to prove yourself. And then there are times you ask yourself, where, Lord, where are you? I'm suffering here. Where are you? And then some of us don't ask that question because we think we got it. Yes, sir. And God is saying that, you know, the next level, I prepared it for you, but you, you're too full of yourself. You got to come down some. I'm telling you today that if you hold on to your faith, that temper says all of these things God will establish you. He will establish you 
and puts you in good company with others who are doing the same thing. But you got to hold on. Sister Thurman, you got to hold on. You got to hold on. Oliva, you got to hold on. Carol, you got to hold on. Misty, praise team, you got to hold on. Don't let go of that. But it's attracting trouble. Hold on to it. Yeah, but I, I don't have to deal with it. No, stay humble. Hold on to it. Don't let it go. Stand to your feet. I want to talk to somebody who's right on the verge of giving up. I like that word staunch. It means stubborn. I grew up with my mom calling me a stubborn, uh, a stubborn little boy. Uh, some of you who know my family personally know that I'm censoring what, what she called me. But she called me that because when I was on to something, I wouldn't let it go. There is a time to be stubborn. And some of us need a little dose of being stubborn with our faith. No, I'm not surrendering my faith. We, some of us need to learn how to say no to the enemy and anybody who's speaking for them. Be stubborn about it. Stubborn doesn't care what you think about them. Doesn't care how you feel about them. The most stubborn people I ever met was at the DMV. I mean, the DMV is notorious for stubborn people, Anthony. You wait in line, you get to the counter, and you say, well, I, I waited in line. Can, can I just stand to the side? No, sir. You have to go get that paper over, over there, get another ticket, and wait in line. But I've been waiting. I mean, I, 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 then, you, then you get funny and pull out some money and say, you know, I, I'll make it worth your time. Sir, go get a ticket. <laughs> stubborn, just stubborn. Right? And, I, I, you know, Anthony bribes them. I never bribed anybody with money or anything like that. <laughs> but we need to be like that in our faith. Some of us give in so easily. We give in so easily. It doesn't take nothing for us to drop the ball. All it takes is a moment of this. It's not even suffering. It's just discomfort. The devil doesn't have to pull out the gun. He just slaps us around a little bit and when he slaps us around a little bit we throw it aside and say I can't take it anymore God says you need to pick that back up and hold on to it and be stubborn about it you ought to be yelling back at Satan you got to come a little harder than that because the objective is not to fight Satan but to resist him that means to stand in his face and be stubborn about it no no I done cried too long. No. He done brought me from too far. No. No, 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 no. Until he has to use other voices to convince you. And even then, no, you can't have my faith. So I, I want to talk to you who, who, right on the verge, nobody knows you're on the verge, but in your mind, you've made it up in your mind that you're going to give up. This is it. I can't take it anymore. That's it. I'm done. This and that. It's, uh, I tried it. You know what? It's, it's not worth it. Uh, you know, this, this thing, you know what? I'm just going to do what I'm going to do because, you know, and th then you start abusing the grace of God and saying, God, will forgive me. You know, I'm just going to give up because, you know, God knows my heart. No, no. At that point, you're, you're no longer under God's mighty hand. You're under your own. And then there's somebody else who just needs prayer because they're trying to hold on and people have no idea. And you can't fault people who come in your face and say insensitive things when they don't know what you're going through. Stop being mad at people. It's church folk can get mad at people in a minute. I ain't going to that church. Well, don't go to that supermarket either because there are people there that are, offend you too. By the way, don't go to that school. And by the way, don't go to the DMV. <laughs> it's praying time. I've spoken enough. If you need to come, walk down these aisles. Let's talk to God about it. You're under attack. He's attacking your family. He's attacking your marriage. He's attacking your children. He's attacking your money. He's attacking your sanity. And he won't let up. 
And you think you're all right because you pushed it down. You pushed it down. You pushed it down. Those are the people that crack all of a sudden and nobody know why they crack. Because you mistook, you mistook suppression for resolution. And pushing it down is not the same as resolving it. So come on down, it's praying time. Maybe you're here and you want to give your life to Jesus. You come on down right now. Come believing that he is the son of God. He had to lose. God even told Jesus, no, no, this time you're going to lose. You're going to lose this time, Jesus. That Friday evening, Jesus, Jesus said, let this cup pass over me. And God said, nope, you got to lose this time. And you got to suffer. All suffering is not from the devil, people. Stop blaming him for everything that's uncomfortable in your life. Sometimes God sends that. For some of us, as he hadn't heard from us in a long time. He hadn't heard from us in a long time. And so he says, you know what, I'm going to let you lose your job. I hadn't heard from you in a while. I'm going to let you lose your job, the job that you prayed for that I gave you because I hadn't heard from you since the second week you worked there. God has a way of getting our attention. So it's praying time.